Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you to another roundtable discussion of the Doctrine and Covenants. My name is Matthew Richardson, Associate Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University, and I'm joined with three of my colleagues, also from Brigham Young University in the Department of Church History and Doctrine. Across the table from me, joining us is Alex Baugh. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Good to be here. Jerry Perkins. Welcome, Jerry. Hi. And Craig Osler. It's good to have you here, Craig. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. We'll begin our discussions today, starting with section 111 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And, and when we look at this, it's, I think it's important to frame at least the time on this, given in August of 1836. There's no doubt about it. This was a good time for the church. It's interesting. Good, good times and bad times coming. We just finished with the Kirtland Temple. And then we find, as it says in the heading here, that this is given in Salem, Massachusetts, which is not your typical location for the revelations we've been receiving thus far. Jerry, if you would, will you frame this section quickly, um, uh, historically, of what's going on in Massachusetts and why we're there, and then we'll jump straight into the text. Well, one of the things that precedes even Massachusetts is the Kirtland situation after the temple. There was extreme poverty. The temple took everything that the saints had. Uh, there was speculation, even instances of greed. So therefore, the prophet Joseph's, one of his main concerns regarding the church was, how are we going to pay our debts? Uh, the 111th section is an interesting opportunity, the prophet Joseph thinks, of gaining money. He goes to Salem, Massachusetts, under the direction of a man by the name of Burgess, seeking a treasure in the basement of a woman's home. Now, that, that kind of sounds odd, I think, to most viewers today, and, and when we look at that as seeking treasure, but frame that out. Alex, I, I know you've talked well, about that. Well, <clears throat> Joseph Smith came from an environment of this kind of cultural thing. So it's not uh, highly unusual. There's certainly members of the church not questioning what he's doing. Uh, this is just Joseph Smith's quick fix, he thinks, to be able to uh, secure some of those necessary funds. And yet, uh, again, I don't think many people in the church would seem, think this was unusual. If I can add, too, it was in Salem where uh, Joseph's father had sent out the ginseng route to China. <laughs> and he knew that the, at that time, uh, even though he was told wrong that a huge treasure or chest of monies, jewels, gems, whatever they brought back from China to pay for that ginseng route had been hidden in, in various homes in Salem. So it didn't seem out of place to him that possibly there could be money there. And there's no doubt about it. They need the money to, to, to yeah. be able to clarify their debt. I think it's interesting what the Lord thinks of this journey, though. In verse number one, he calls it folly. The Lord your God, I'm not displeased with your coming on this journey, notwithstanding your follies. Joseph's intent was pure. He didn't have any hidden agendas. However, the Lord looks and says, what we are doing here is folly. The, the definition of folly is lacking good sense, foolish actions or conduct in an unprofitable endeavor. And, and his effort or the Lord's comments revolve around the idea that the Lord is saying, come to me and let me solve your difficulties, your financial problems. What you're involved in here is simply folly. When you say that it's unprofitable, they do return from Salem on this journey without the funds that they were seeking. But yet if we finished only with verse one there, I think we missed the beauty of what's happening in section 11 because this really isn't so much as a chastisement, notwithstanding the follies, but then we continue on and we start to see, wait, let's, let's frame this in, in broader terms as, as you were saying, Jerry. For example, let's go to verse 2. He says, I have much treasure in this city for you. But, but then here's an interesting turn, at least of, of the way one might look at this. It's treasure for the benefit of Zion and many people in the city whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion. I interesting thoughts there, Greg? Well, one is uh, the idea that the treasure is used, that word's used in other passages of Scripture in Exodus. When Moses is gathering the children of Israel, the Lord refers to his people as a peculiar treasure, the segula. Right. And so it, 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 I think he has reference that the Lord's treasure is not the gold and the gems of the earth because he owns it all anyway. And the second part is Joseph's not seeking 
uh, the, the monies for his own good or for himself or for his family, it's because as a church or as the united firm, this group of men who have taken on the business aspects of the church to be able to keep it financially solvent, they owe money. Joseph's not going to profit anything. All he's going to be able to do is pay creditors that he signed notes in good faith that he'll repay. Right. That's who, who the money's for. He doesn't, a previous revelation spoke of those in New York City that had given them loans to be able to stock their, their, uh, their stores, to purchase land so that people could come and live on them and improve them. And, and he knows the Lord has told him he's to pay his debts or the debts of the kingdom. You know, and perhaps what Jerry was bringing up is an important part of here is, is his motives seem to be pure and, and things are going to be able to bring forth Zion and, and reconcile those debts. And, but maybe it's the how experiences, concerned of how to be able to do it. We go to verse five, concern not yourself about your debts. It's not like saying you don't have to worry about paying the debts because it says here, I will give you the power to pay them, verse six, concern not yourselves about Zion. The things that are taking place, by the way, in Missouri are also, that there's a lot of concern there. For I will deal mercifully with her. It's be at hand, or at least your eye on the mark at hand. Could I, Joseph's two big concerns right now is the debt of the church and then also the persecution in Zion. Those are the two key issues of his, of his life. That's what occupies his time. And the Lord in, in this section is saying, Joseph, do you have the trust and the faith that I will order your life in such a way that I will care for these debts? And the folly that Joseph's involved in, in addition to the fact that he's there for money and the real treasure is people, the second folly is, is the Lord has said, come to me with your problems. 104th section, he says, verily I say unto you concerning your debts, Behold, it is my will that you shall pay them. It is my will that you shall humble yourselves before me and obtain this blessing. And inasmuch as you are diligent and humble and exercise the prayer of faith, behold, I will soften the hearts of those to whom you are in debt until I shall send a means unto you for your deliverance. And so Joseph is doing the best he can, but the Lord is saying, you're, you're forgetting one very significant element. I have promised you I will take care of that debt. And so this is an issue of faith and it's kind of experiential. Well, and the trust that goes on, uh, when, you're, when you're talking about that, I, I think of this, um, there's I in verse one, um, we see an I in verse two, I will, verse four, I will give this city, I will give you verse five, I will deal, verse six. Nine times it talks about that I will, I will take care of this, Joseph. I, by my will, these things will be, be handled. He, he gives indication here, he says, uh, I have control of this situation. And in verse 11, I don't know if I'm jumping too far ahead, but it's in, your, in the context of your I will. Therefore be as wise as serpents and yet without sin, and I will order all things for your good as fast as you are able to receive them. Mm -hmm. Now that's a promise not just to Joseph, but that's a promise to you and to me. You know, let's, let's look at verse 10 really quickly. For there are more treasures than one in you, for you in this city. Alex, thoughts on that? It seems like that this isn't necessarily a lost mission here, uh, right. you know, because there are more treasures. He talks about that throughout this experience and that there will come a time where I will give this city in verse four into your hands. Well, look at verse three. He says, while you're here, I'm gonna use you. Uh, form an acquaintance in this city. Uh, we know they preached. Uh, Sidney Ridden preached from the Lyceum. Uh, he says in verse seven, Terry in this place. Uh, he says in verse uh, nine, Inquire diligently concerning the more ancient inhabitants. Sounds like a little genealogy there uh, for Joseph. We know he's from that area, at least his ancestral home. So he's saying too, while you're here, uh, let's take advantage of the situation and uh, preach, make it, acquaintance. And they'd um, stay after the revelation is received. They stay for nearly a month yeah. and do go from door to door. They do become acquainted with the history even of that, and it's rich history in Salem, right. this seaport that's one of, makes one of the most wealthy cities actually in, the, in America at a time. And we have record of uh, Oliver Cowdery and, and Joseph and Sidney Rigdon going to museums, to libraries, uh, it becomes a time of, of learning more about uh, what has taken place in that area. I mean, Salem's famous for more than Joseph going there. And they learn of bigotry and religion. And, and it's a time of education for them also. And I think it's important to note, you know, we talk about him going to Salem. He didn't go directly from Kirtland to Salem. He, he stops in New York to meet with the creditors. 
Yeah. This is a man who, who, as we've mentioned, is, is doing what he thinks is best. He's, he's like Nephi going forth without knowing beforehand what he's to do, but he's going to do something and, and be an, a man that's active and trying to help relieve the, the church of the debt they're in. I think it's an interesting thought. And so when we come back to the experience of what's happening here, there is a rich heritage of people that come. It's not, it's not a mission for lost. As a matter of fact, when it says that there are more, more treasures here for you and that will come in due time, there, there is an evidence that there is a future treasure that will come to pass. In 1841, Matt, uh, Erastus Snow was sent by Joseph Smith to Salem and literally now to fulfill the revelation. And within just months, he converts a large number of people. By 1842, we have uh, well over 100 members uh, in the Salem area. So the real treasure is city, and this city is people. And people will build the kingdom. They'll finance the kingdom. Uh, I think that's the, the central core of the message. And the Lord does it in his mysterious ways, where, where <laughs> what we think immediately might not be really to task, but yet it does come to fruition and the fruit is harvested. Let's turn our direction to section 112. We, we skip now from August of 1836, almost a year later to July of 1837. Um, 1837 and 1838 is a tumultuous time within the church. Joseph once described it as, he said, quote, it seemed as though all powers of earth and hell were combining their influence in an especial manner to overthrow the church. Many became disaffected toward me as though I were the sole cause of these very evils, which were actually brought upon us by the brethren, not giving heed to my counsel. This is a hard time, and when we come to section 112, we, we, we see an interesting time with some of that disunity going on. And um, Craig, will you frame this one for us? We're, we're in Kirtland of July of 1837. Well, uh, since the revelation had been given in Salem, uh, a date has come and passed uh, in which Zion was going to be redeemed. September 11th. Uh -huh, 1836, because the saints weren't prepared to enter uh, into Zion. And now what we find is, is he says these darkest days is that this disease of apostasy has even caused affliction in the Quorum of the Twelve. Yeah. In fact, the First Presidency. We'll find there's a member of the First Presidency that's dropped by yeah, this revelation uh -huh, at this time. And there's groups of people that are trying to form another church and sustain David Whitmer as president of the church. But I think it's interesting as we look at what the revelation's about, to uh, see that in these dark days, the Lord is not <laughs> without a plan. That he knows that uh, he needs to call the, cor the president of the Quorum of the Twelve in for an interview, so to speak, with the, with the Lord and give him his, his walking orders that's going to bring about then the salvation of the kingdom. Good. It's interesting that he, that he does come and address those that are in um, the focus view here. Um, Thomas B. Marsh, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, he'll speak to the Quorum of the Twelve themselves and, and almost say, let's, let's get top right and trickle down hopefully through bottom. Could I make just one statement regarding the, the introduction that Craig gave so well? Um, during this period of time between November of 80, 1837 and June of 1838, 300 members were excommunicated during that period of time, which was a tenth. So today, if that were to occur, it'd be over a million people excommunicated in about eight months. But not only the numbers, but the who was excommunicated, the, the three witnesses, four members of the Quorum of the Twelve, many of the Seventy, and one member of the First Presidency. That would be absolutely devastating, which gives an indication as to the power and the importance of the 112th section where the Lord is saying to Thomas P. Marsh, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, we must order our house. That's right. And obviously they didn't heed it because as you mentioned a few months later, yes, they're leaving. Occurred. They're That's leaving. Right. So he gives them the solution to their problems. Well, and this is directed as mentioned to Thomas B. Marsh in the, in the first opening experiences. It seems that Thomas is um, a little bent out of shape here. Um, and, and when we look at the heading here, it says that the prophet records that this revelation was received on the day when the gospel was first preached in England. And it seems that that has some relevance, at least background, to what's going on here. Alex? Well, Thomas B. Marsh uh, has come all the way from Missouri to get this revelation. He needs answers. He wants help. And by the way, it's really a revelation not only to Marsh, but to the Twelve. That's right. But the month previous, uh, Heber C. Kimball and Orson Hyde, two members of the Twelve, had left Kirtland and had traveled to uh, England to there begin the preaching of the gospel to the people of Great Britain. And Marsh wanted to be that man. <laughs> and uh, I think he was highly disappointed. And, um, and he really is uh, searching for some answers as to what is his role and how can I help my brethren 
And uh, the Lord clearly spells it out here. Verse number two, Verily I say unto you, there have been some few things in thine heart and with thee, with which I, the Lord, am not well pleased. That's right. And so even the quorum of the, even the president of the quorum of the twelve is out of harmony. Uh, and, and the Lord, again, is saying, we must, we must come into line with your call. And I don't think they really understand their call. You know, and Alex, you bring up the part about humility is look at verse 3. Nevertheless, inasmuch as thou hast abased thyself, thou shalt be exalted. Verse 5. Contend thou therefore morning by morning and day after day and let the warning voice go forth. Not, not necessarily the criticizing voice, but the warning voice go forth. And, and we see throughout this experience of being humble. It's interesting um, when you go back to 1835, the original charge given to the, gen the general charge to the Quorum of the Twelve at that point, Oliver Cowdery gives on 15th of February, where, where he says a part there, he says, I therefore warn you to cultivate great humility, for I know the pride of the human heart Beware lest the flatterers of the world lift you up. Beware lest your afflictions be captivated by worldly object. Let your ministry be first. And what an interesting reminder is that was 1835, and, and we're really not that far along here. 1837 is yet there is the key to the charge. Verse number 10 again, be thou humble. That's right. Uh, the entire, uh, m I shouldn't say the entire 12, but many of the 12 had that problem, not just Marsh. But certainly, uh, Lord kind of singles him out as the president that you've got to watch it, but you've got to admonish your brethren. And he brings that out. Uh, where are we at? Look, verse 12. Uh -huh. Uh, pray for thy brethren of the twelve, admonish them sharply for my name's sake, and let them be admonished for all their sins, and be faithful before me unto my name. And after their temptations and much tribulation, behold, I, the Lord, will feel after them. I really love that phrase. And if they, will, if they harden not their hearts and stiffen not their necks against me, they shall be converted. I think that's interesting. I think they have testimonies. Yeah. They just haven't had that Peter experience of conversion and I will heal them. And then, the, and then it goes on, as you were saying, not just to Thomas B. Marsh, but go, verse 14, I say unto you what I say, um, uh, what I say unto you, I say unto all the 12, arise, gird up uh, your loins, take up your cross, follow me and feed my sheep. And then there's 15, exalt not yourselves, rebel not against my servants. Yeah. So it's a wonderful element here is, is once again is bringing um, unity and order back into the house of the Quorum of the Twelve. Craig? Yeah, I was just noticing that, that phrase, one, when you mentioned converted, you know, uh, the Twelve need to have uh, this being born again experience that's through and through. But more, that phrase re in verse 15 you just finished with, rebel not against my servant Joseph. That's what the problem was. Yeah is really, it was coming an open rebellion against Joseph. You know, with all that aside, I think we have to move on again of what the Lord, he says, I'm gonna get the 12 in order, but he has a plan. Wow. The Gospels, we mentioned, has barely gone to England with, you know, Heber C. Kimball and Orson Hyde and those brethren from Upper Canada, uh, the Fieldings and uh, who have gone over there. But then he lets Thomas know the part that the 12 have in taking the Gospel to the world which I think is really the message that the Lord wants to give to Thomas, is you've got to get your house in order because within a, what, another two, three years, the 12 will be sent on a mission to England. Right. Verse 21, as you were saying, is the 12 is duly recommended and authorized by you shall have power to open the door of my kingdom unto any nation whithersoever ye shall send them. And that's part of their apostolic charge. We saw that in the DNC section 107 given in 1835. And, and, and to be able to go forth and teach. Well, go ahead. I, I was just thinking, before we go quickly past, there is an emphasis here of keys. And in verse 15, he emphasizes, the Lord emphasizes the Quorum of the Twelve, Joseph has the keys. 107th section, the Quorum of the Twelve is under the direction of the First Presidency. And they are, many of these individuals are chafing at that concept. And then he he gives them an indication of their keys, That's their right. responsibilities, but the very first issue he emphasizes is you brethren have to remember you are under the direction of the prophet, the first presidency, he has the keys. And, and that's an important element and sometimes the confusion comes because they do have keys themselves as it says in verse 16 pertaining to the 12. But then we go all the way over here into verse 31, it says which power you hold, referring obviously to the keys and the power which they do hold. Now, they don't have all of the keys. That's correct. Uh, at least the 12 don't. Certainly all the keys have been restored to Joseph Smith and right. Oliver Cowdery. But um, that will come, 
Hence, again, verse 30, for unto the twelve and those, the first presidency, who are appointed with you to be your counselors and your leaders. He's trying to say the twelve and the first presidency will hold uh, all of the keys of the kingdom. But at that time, the twelve have been given the commission, and they Certainly. can authorize <clears throat> others to go forward. As I mentioned, I... I remember it's been many, many years now since President Kimball used this section as his text when he chastened the general authorities. <laughs> because it, he, the church had not moved forward into other nations the way they should. Lengthen your stride. Uh, and he specifically cited verse 21 when he talks about whosoever the 12 would send to open up these nations to the gospel. And then he introduced them to a man by the name of David M. Kennedy. And he says, I think maybe he can help you find these keys you seem to have lost and allow these doors to shut and rust on their hinges. And it's that time that the gospel, he said, I can see that iron curtains are not a problem to the Lord. Bamboo curtains are not a problem to the Lord. He wants to bless all of his children, but he commissioned again and reminded the 12 that they were responsible to see that the gospel went forth to all the world. Well, Finally, we come to the end of this where in verse 33, he says, um, Verily I say unto you, Behold how great is your calling. Cleanse your hearts and your garments, lest the blood of this generation be required your hand. Reminding them of, of their call. Let's take a look at section 113. Alex, will you frame that one for us historically? Well, we had the, uh, by the time this uh, revelation or section is received, we've had the great Kirtland apostasy. Joseph's had to flee Kirtland. He leaves in January of 1838. He arrives on uh, March 14th in Far West. So we know this revelation had to give, been given the latter part of March. And uh, I'm sure there were those brethren down there who were just waiting to have Joseph finally in their midst. I mean, uh, during all these years the church has been in Missouri, Joseph hasn't lived here. And now he's here. <clears throat> and here we have a wonderful uh, kind of question-answer session uh, in, I don't know whose home, it'd be kind of interesting to know, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think it's very significant that this is the first of the Far West Revelations, there's seven of them, and uh, this marks the beginning of, of Joseph Smith's time in Missouri, which will be short-lived, but uh, this, is his, uh, this is his home now. Uh, they're getting together, they're asking questions, uh, they're obviously having a little scripture discussion of Isaiah 11, and uh, Joseph will give them some background. Now, Isaiah 11 plays into this uh, much earlier. That's right. uh, the night of uh, September 21st, 22nd, uh, Moroni quotes to Joseph Smith Isaiah 11 and says it is about to be fulfilled. So here's Joseph going, well, okay, here's some of the fulfillment of that revelation in, in terms of an explanation. I think that's remarkable. So we're dealing with Isaiah, at least in the first several verses of, of this section in 113, and then questions, you mentioned a question and answer period in about verse seven, Elias Higby starts to ask a few questions. Let's, let's start at the very beginning then, um, uh, dealing with the Isaiah chapter 11, and it's pretty straightforward. Verse one, who is the stem of Jesse spoken of in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth verses of the 11th chapter of Isaiah? Craig, I know that we've had conversation on this before is a little bit of insider background on the notion of maybe what a stem is. Um, just quickly, thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, in, in the Hebrew, it comes out more of a trunk or a stump. And in the context of Isaiah 11 is the idea that you've had this uh, forest of trees and what you have left are stumps. It's been cleaned. You know, the Assyrians have come down. And uh, I think that's what the Lord's referring to is, is still that there's still life, though, in right. this trunk. And there's a rod that grows out of it. And uh, it was interesting is when we, we lived in that area of uh, the world, you find these olive trees, which I always associate with any prophecy about a tree. And you literally see a rod that came out of the, the trees that they, one of the uses they'd have is they'd come and break it off and have this big gnarly end. <laughs> and uh, a shepherd would use it. Not as a, one of these crookneck staffs, but to be able to guide his sheep. He could throw it ahead, he could use it as a weapon. And I thought it's interesting the symbolism being used here in verse three when they ask, well, what is that rod? This is hoter. What is the hoter, this offshoot from the trunk? And they say it's a servant of Christ. And I thought that's perfect because he's in the hands yeah, of Christ and being able to use to gather sheep or defend the flock. Now let's jump back really quickly. So we've got okay. this, this trunk or this stem and it says, well, what is that trunk? Yeah, and it says, verse two is, it's, it's, Christ. it's Christ. It's Jesus Christ. So there's our foundational where things, all things will come forth. And then we come to verse three is, okay, we've got this rod growing forth from, from the stump of Christ, so to speak. 
well, well, who is that? And then we come to verse four and it says, well, it's the servant in the hands, partly descendant of Jesse as well as Ephraim or the house of Joseph or whom there is laid much power. And that's important is there is power laid upon this individual. And then in verse five, it starts to say, well, what is the root of Jesse spoken of in the 10th and 11th verse? And it says, well, this is a descendant of Jesse as well as of Joseph, whom rightly belongs to the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom. So there's no doubt about it. This is someone that's tied into the stump of Christ with keys of, of, of the power. A servant of a, Christ. A, it is a servant of Christ, not more than Christ. Yeah. I think it's only because Joseph has modest. <laughs> that he, that seems he's, not, that's he's, not, he's not saying who it is, but it's, but, but it's definitely him. It, it seems like it can't be anything else, uh, you know, as far as well, that goes. What, what One does, who has keys yeah. of kingdom and the authority thereof. And it's to Joseph that he gathered. To, we say it's to the covenant, but it's to the man who holds the keys to be able to minister the covenant that the people are gathering. In Isaiah 11, there's the emphasis, the same emphasis as is in verse number six is the concept of an ensign. It's a standard, it's, a, it's an indication of authority, it's a gathering place. And I think it's interesting that Joseph is that ensign. And later on, it'll say that the people of the church are the ensign, but Joseph becomes the ensign uh, as he restores the gospel and people gather to this magnificent gospel that he restores, he becomes a standard of gathering. Well, and maybe that's where Elias, Elias Higby's, Higby's questions come of Zion is what do we have reference to is those whom in verse eight, God shall call in the last days that should hold the power of priesthood and bring again to Zion this notion of, of through the restoration, we have a Zion being built and in Zion a standard to all people that will be able to break the bands we see in verse nine, loose those bands and from her neck, which are the curses and, and be able to stand as the ensign to the people. Well, we've covered quite a bit of material from uh, section 111 of seeing how the Lord is directing the prophet in, in greater means than just immediate debts. Um, we, we, we see the wonderful element of, of riding the ship, of being able to, to bring the, those who are leading um, Zion, setting that establishment uh, well, as well as understanding the role of the prophet Joseph in the gospel of, of the kingdom of Christ. Thank you for your help and expertise today. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.